Hi, I'm Christopher Ray, and welcome to the third of three video lectures about Yuhua's novel, Brothers. In this video lecture, I want to argue that Brothers can be read as an acoustic novel, as a symphony of the ages. In the first part of this brief lecture, I want to talk about how we can hear the music of Brothers. How can you read any work of fiction, like a novel, acoustically? Brothers is such an extreme work. It's extremely long, and the mode seems to be one that's quite bombastic. We get all this violence, farce, and sentimentalism that seems to be really beyond the pale. And so I think that one of the things that Yuhua is doing here is giving us variations on a theme. Some of these are themes that he's explored in his earlier works, like To Live, we get a lot of historical violence. In his early experimentalist works, we also see a lot of surgical and really extreme mutilation of corpses. But I want to argue that if we use an acoustic approach and specifically view this work as something of a symphony, we can see some of its complexity and we can understand how it operates down to the level of the characters. Second, I want to argue that Brothers is both symptomatic of and trying to actively represent two ages of big hollow sounds. On the one hand, we have all of this revolutionary sloganeering, all of these empty words in praise of the revolution that we get from the Cultural Revolution specifically, but we also have a period in modern China, 21st century China, but even stretching back to the 90s where there's rapid economic growth, there's all this promise, there's all of this hot air accompanying the great rise of this great nation. And one of the moments that Yu Hua is anticipating in this 2005-2006 novel is the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics. This novel is certainly a workout for the eyes, but I also want us to attune our ears and try to hear its sounds. Because this is a novel that creates resonances between the Cultural Revolution era and the Reform era, it's not like one happened and then it becomes ancient history and now we're in the present. No, we are actually having refrains coming back we're getting a lot of repetition in the way that people act and the way that people talk. In terms of literary analysis, I think that if we approach Brothers from an acoustic perspective, it helps us to appreciate the structure of the novel and the mode of the novel. If we simply focus on subject matter, we may say this is a novel about China, or it's a novel about Cultural Revolution China and Reform Era China. I feel like the subject matter is often very easy to identify, but how do you analyze mode? Well, mode is a way or manner in which something occurs, or is experienced, expressed, or done. But there's also a musical connotation to the term. In music, it refers to a set of musical notes forming a scale and from which melodies and harmonies are constructed. So we might think if we viewed a novel as a work of music, well, what are the notes? What are the melodies and what are the harmonies? Yu Hua has written quite extensively about his love of music, specifically Western classical music. He was writing about music around the time that he wrote Brothers around 2004, he has also written more in recent years about his love of classical music and how it's influenced his writing. Yu Hua has written about his love of the greats like Bach, Mozart, and Chopin. He also mentions how he has taken inspiration from 20th century composers like Dmitry Shostakovich, whose Symphony No. 7 he credits as partly inspiring brothers. As I've said before, we should take all authorial self-interpretations with a huge grain of salt, but I do think that Yu Hua, like Zhang Ailing, is very perceptive and quite transparent about some of his ideas and where they come from. And so I think that we can use this as a basis for some of our own theorization. And we can do so also in relation to a whole body of scholarship about sound, and sound as it relates to literature specifically, about how you hear a novel, about how sound is represented on the page through onomatopoeia, you know, gudong, kacha, huala, you know, the sounds of a martial arts novel. There are studies of music in a whole variety of genres, including studies specifically focused on the period after the Cultural Revolution. Andrew Jones at UC Berkeley has even written something of a trilogy of studies focused on modern Chinese popular music, focusing on rock and roll, particularly in Beijing in the 1980s and 90s, jazz in 1930s, 1940s Shanghai, and then also popular music on the airwaves and on the radio in places like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, as well as mainland China during the 1960s. In this course, we've read other novels with particularly acoustic elements like Shen Songwen's Border Town, Zhang Ailing's The Rice Sprout Song, and Wang Yini's The Song of Everlasting Sorrow. And I'd mentioned that sound and its various manifestations is a very vibrant part of modern Chinese cultural studies. So let's open things up for a moment. If we think of sound as a metaphor and try to apply it to literature, here are a few of just many possibilities, right? You could talk about the volume, the pitch, the timber, the refrains that we get in literature. We could talk about literature being divided into verse and chorus, about bridges, about different movements. We could talk about the tempo of the work. We could talk about its various syncopations. We can use a whole array of descriptors to describe sonic quality, whether it's a type of frenetic pace, if it's a romantic tone, if it's an epic mode, or maybe a discordant sound. 
Brothers is an acoustic novel in several senses. We have a book that is divided into two parts or movements that have very different tone to them and affect. We have refrains of violence and discord coming back again and again. This is a novel with a lot of conflict between characters. A melodrama is literally a drama set to music, one that has a melody. And we could see that there's a volume and pitch that varies quite a lot. There are lots of highs and lows in Brothers. We could say that Baldi Lee, as one of the main divas on our stage, has solos where he has these long utterances, which are then echoed or repeated by the chorus of supporting characters. There is also far in the background a group of spear carriers, you could say, people who are inhabitants of Leo Town who remain anonymous, but are kind of a supporting chorus to a lot of his activities. Overall, while we do have main characters who we hear from more often than others, this is a polyphonous novel in which we get many different voices. And while some characters can repeat themselves quite a lot, we also have a lot of changes in melody and rhythm and harmony. So if you take a character like Baldi Lee, he can be quite crude and vulgar at some moments and very self-serving. He also has his tender moments as well, in which we start to feel a little bit sympathetic towards him. But he seems to oscillate quite dramatically in different parts of the novel. It's definitely not a linear progression. You could also say that Baldi Lee, with his kind of standout status, yes, he's one of two brothers, but the narrative definitely favors him over Song Gang. And Baldi Lee, it seems like, is the conductor of this orchestra that we have in this novel. I would say that there's a composition that has kind of been set by history, or it's a kind of composition in the making, right? It is not yet completely written yet. And he has some control over the different voices that we hear, the different sounds coming out of this orchestra, but that control, while real, is nevertheless quite limited. I've written before that this novel's alteration between tragedy and farce has been very difficult for some critics to reconcile. Yuha has likened composing the novel to writing a symphony, and that he has deliberately put in these moments of Wagnerian bombast, in which we have like a lot of timpani and drums beating out the violence, like the violence meted out to Song Fanping, or other moments where things are extremely crude and all of the pageantry surrounding the Virgin Beauty contest. But then he'll abruptly and deftly shift tone. Here's just one example from part one in the novel, where Song Fanping and Li Lan are about to get married, it's their wedding day, but Song Fanping gets beat up by his neighbors, and he has this bloodied face, but it's still their wedding night, and he brings out these candies that his sister has given them from Shanghai for a wedding gift, and he shares them with the boys who are absolutely delighted, and they have this moment of eating this candy that to Chinese readers will be a very nostalgic one. So this is a moment that is tender and celebratory, where this family has persevered over these obstacles, come together over great odds, and it becomes the moment of nostalgia for the boys after they're grown up and their parents are dead. But in the moment, as Baldi Lee is all blissed out, he hears his parents having sex in the other room. It's a kind of a different kind of catharsis that we're suddenly getting here. The boys later think that all these sounds are the parents consuming the rest of the candies, and they go into the bedroom, find all the rest of the white rabbits, and consume them themselves. So I would argue that Yuhua is writing in a way that is trying to prevent us from just slipping into a rhythm. He wants us to feel this sense of disjunction, or that there's a type of musical chaos here. And he's written about his appreciation of this type of chaos when traveling to Amsterdam, for example. There are many small rivers crisscrossing Amsterdam. From a boat, you might unexpectedly see a couple of pretty girls sitting quietly on a stone bench reading books. Like a modernist musical composition, these young women are a brief melodic section that interrupts long and inharmonious songs and thus impart the feeling of happening upon herefore too unheard of beauty. If the whole piece were as melodious as the brief section in the middle, one would not notice the melody in the first place. That is why when I wrote Brothers, especially the second half, I incorporated so many disjunctive moments. The novel is almost polemical in inserting all of these disjunctive elements and trying to keep us off base, as if it's saying, that this is what it sounds like to live in China nowadays. And amidst all of this hot noise and clamor, we are searching for meaning and often being frustrated. Let's consider just how Baldi Lee talks. He has some Baldi Lee-isms, like, in an hour I will spread my wings like a great rock and soar away. This seems like it's taken from a completely different idiom than the one that he inhabits. Or sometimes he is rebroadcasting very well-known phrases like, I won't take a single needle or thread from the masses, just like the communist troops of old. When they pass through the village, they will not rape and pillage. When it comes to history, truth will always win out. This is a type of cliched truism that we hear again and again. And as another great sage once wrote, when Baldi Lee does rebroadcast these things, he doesn't seem like an actual human being. He seems a bit more like a broadcast station, like a machine that is churning things out, but often at the wrong time. 
where he's applying them to incongruous settings. And the volume is so great and the effect is so discombobulating that it seems like the original meaning of these utterances collapses under their own weight into farce. To be sure, Yuhua is not the first critic to point out that China has been a place that is overwhelmed, completely awash in advertising. In the revolutionary age, we got too much revolutionary sloganeering. Now in the commercial age, we're getting too much commercial sloganeering. Even after you die, people will sell ads at your funeral. But nor is the messaging just split in two, where we got revolutionary slogans during the revolutionary era and commercial slogans during the commercial era. Absolutely not. It's all mixed together. So we can see in part one, when we're in the Cultural Revolution, there is a lot of commercial sloganeering. And of course, when we move on to the reform and opening period, there's a lot of those old revolutionary slogans that are trotted out for commercial purposes. So Yuhua's novel anticipates a lot of the pageantry surrounding the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics. This is the moment where China was really going to explode onto the stage and show off that it is a modern, developed power. I would note that the inaugural National Virgin Beauty Competition was originally going to be called the National Hymen Olympic Games. In the actual Olympic Games, we got a monumental, elaborately choreographed display of all of these symbols of Chinese contributions to world culture, like papermaking and calligraphy and movable type printing, as well as the representation of very recognizable stylized cultural practices like Tai Chi or ritual music. And the key word that official China was promoting around 2008 was harmony, he, and specifically a harmonious society, or he xie shu hui that everybody in China is supposed to be singing the same tune, a very positive, harmonious tune. And this is also the tune that is being sung to the world. So the China song, you could say, would be one of harmony. I would not argue that Yu Hua's main agenda in Brothers is to comment on China's external relations. However, anybody who is familiar with the voice of official China on the international stage will note that there's a lot of disharmony. There's a lot of disjunction between the expressions of friendship and the vituperative diplomatic utterances that often use extremely strong language to condemn anybody that Beijing disagrees with. Brothers, to a certain degree, mimics this type of behavior, this discombobulation, this shifting between registers at will over a single sentence or single page. Muzak was a company whose name became synonymous with a kind of pervasive, unchallenging, warmed-over sounds where they take a popular tune and create a very light instrumental version that they would play in the shopping mall or in the elevator. So it would just be kind of the background music of daily commercial life. And one of the most profound messages about Chinese society, the Chinese society both of the revolutionary age and of our current commercial age that we find in Brothers, is that the background music of both ages is this type of discombobulation, this type of discordance, these types of disparities in tone that we get just as our daily life. Overall, I would say that Yuhua does a remarkable job of modulating all of these different tones only occasionally does he tip the farseer's hand and kind of devolve into this very mawkish type of music into easy listening. But this is all testimony to Yuhua's ambition, because it takes a lot of nerve to write a symphony of the ages.